Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry, and this is my talk show. I've also got the episodes Contra Thoughts, where those are kind of more um, several times a week, just talking about various subjects. This is longer form, uh, where I sit down with someone and we talk about uh, things that matter. And uh, for this, I sit down with Tom Askell. He's a pastor, been a pastor a long time, several decades out of Florida. Uh, he is concerned about the Southern Baptist Convention and just uh, faithful orthodoxy and biblical uh, fidelity in general. So if you're not a Southern Baptist, this still very much applies uh, to you because, well, Southern Baptist Convention is the largest denomination and the seminaries and colleges train a huge percentage of the pastors that go on to other Bible churches, evangelical free churches, oftentimes even Presbyterian churches and the like. So uh, it does matter. So go ahead and watch this to its uh, entirety. It does help the uh, algorithm, as it were, to push it out and tell people that um, people want to listen to this and it'll share it with more people. And it really is, I think, a helpful conversation. He has a lot of good uh, nuggets of wisdom, a lot of um, decisions to be made and how to make those decisions for churches, for people, for young college students, for seminarians, uh, for, you know, elderly folks, everybody in between as far as the fidelity of the local church. So go ahead and enjoy this conversation and uh, drop a comment and like if you don't, um, if you don't like it, that's okay. You can drop a dislike. I'm encouraging people to uh, write or comment dislike. That's okay too. Uh, but people ever know, everybody knows that you've disliked it. So you might get some pushback. But anyway, enjoy the conversation and uh, share it please. And uh, we'll see you next time. Hey everyone, welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry, and I've got my special guest today is uh, Pastor Tom Askell. He's a pastor down in Florida, leads Founders Ministries, and um, your husband, father, uh, grandfather. And uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit more about you, Tom, and, and your work, and um, how long you've been in ministry, and all the rest. Okay, yeah, thanks, Richard, for having me. I'm glad to yeah, be a part you. of the podcast today, and I am in Cape Coral, Florida. It's on the southwest coast. It's a twin city with Fort Myers, about 100 miles south of Tampa, and uh, I've been here 35, almost, almost 35 and a half years as pastor of the Grace Baptist Church in Cape Coral, born and raised in Texas, and grew up in a Southern Baptist home and church, uh, pastored a small Southern Baptist church in College Station, Texas, while I was a student at A&M, and then went to Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth and served on a pastoral staff at a church in Dallas for a little over five years, and then moved from there uh, out here to uh, Florida. So I'm, Don and I have been married 41 years. We have six kids, five of them, of them are married, and all but the oldest child who's unmarried live right here in Florida and are part of the church with us. We have 14 grandkids, one on the way. Right. So uh, we have a full and fun life. And I've been involved with Founders Ministries from the beginning. We started it in 1982 in a prayer meeting at our first conference in 83. And I've been the president of Founders for, I forget how long, but uh, maybe a couple of decades or so. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Well, again, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, I've, uh, I've, admired your work both from afar most well usually it's just from afar i've never been to a conference and we've never met in person um but one of the things that really kind of solidified me um i used to sell phones for verizon and yeah. there's a lot of downtime as a salesman right and this was in louisville i went you know, to southern seminary and so there's a lot of seminarians as well and uh either in school or just graduated and at the end of 19 it was kind of a slow night it was maybe December, November, something like that. And one of my coworkers had said, hey, have you seen this documentary? Have you seen this thing uh, by what standard? And I thought, mm -hmm. I mean, I like the title. I, you know, <laughs> if I know what they're getting at. And um, we, watched, we watched the whole thing. Wow. <laughs> it's like an hour, an hour and a half or whatever it is on you, shift. You watch it on the smartphone? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I've watched it one or two other times since then. Yeah. And I'll tell you, it's it, it was revealing to me uh, i graduated in 2019 just after that yeah. and i didn't realize myself being not in the southern baptist convention although being in louisville and kind of breathing the air of southern seminary and everything 
I didn't realize the politics and, you mm-hmm. know, kind of heard about resolution nine and this yeah. and that and other things. And it wasn't really, I didn't really have much of an opinion either way. Um, and then the last real two years, 20 months or so with, you know, restrictions and everything like that, government stuff has really, yeah. I think crystallized for a lot of people and 2021, um, Nashville conference was, I think, pretty revealing too. So, right. Um, I wanted to ask you, so I had, um, well, it was, it was an article Litton Ed Litton before he was a president earlier this year. And I remember reading the article. I didn't know who he was. And it said, you know, he said something about, you know, I don't know why the conservative Baptist network exists. We're all inerrantists. <laughs> we all believe the Bible, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And I, I was thinking already kind of, you know, saying what by what standard and paying attention to a lot of other things. I thought, yeah, well, but inerrancy is not the question. It's sufficiency. Everybody keeps talking about sufficiency or or lack of sufficiency and saying, well, you got to read this. You got to do this. You got to do the work. You got to and all the kind of woke ideology and critical theory and intersectionality and all this stuff that is very foreign to most Christians Mm -hmm. and definitely most Southern Baptists. And I just remember reading that and thinking, but it's sufficiency. Sufficiency is the issue. And he doesn't, he didn't even mention it. It wasn't even in the article. So what is the conservative Baptist network the CBN? I know, I know you're a part of that. Uh, Can you flesh that out a little bit for us? Yeah. Well, first of all, let me just tell you that I'm not formally a part of the conservative Baptist network. Okay. Uh, These are my friends, but I'm not a member um, you know, I've, I've been invited to some of their events and things, and we've tried to partner together where we can. And I certainly support and encourage what they are doing. Um, they began uh, in the wake of to 2019. I think they fi- formally launched in 2020. And they, they talked to me along the way. They, they wanted me to be aware of what they were doing. And it was great. You know, I, so I'm, I'm a, uh, appreciative of what they're trying to do. They see concerns in the Southern Baptist Convention the same way that I do, that we have drifted significantly away from just some basic foundational principles that do all relate to the sufficiency of Scripture. And what makes this such a tough thing to deal with, not just in the SBC, but in the broader evangelical world, is that many of the people who are espousing these uh, wrong ideologies, some of them not intentionally and some of them are not uh, wittingly, But nevertheless, doing so, they are doing it as inerrantists. They're doing it saying, but we signed the Baptist faith message. We've signed the Danvers statement. We signed the Chicago statement on biblical inerrancy and on and on and on, which in my mind and my response to some who've made those arguments is, well, that makes it all the worse because (laughs) you're signing documents that if you understood them uh, the way they should be understood in light of authority, inerrancy, and sufficiency of scripture, uh, you would not then be either advocating or complicit in allowing these other ideas to be advocated under your watch. And yet that's exactly what's happening. So CBN sees that in the SBC. Uh, It's largely being led by the CBNs, largely, though though they don't uh, say, you know, we're Calvinist or non-Calvinist, with my non-Calvinist Southern Baptist brothers uh, last couple of years, whereas we used to have a lot of uh, intramural debates about the doctrines of grace. And we, we need to still have those down the road. None, you know, we're not, we, those are important issues, but what we're facing now is more important than that. Uh, what we're facing now is foundational yeah. to the whole nature of the Christian religion. And uh, we both see that, but both sides see that. And so we're partnering together. Okay, that's great. Are they out? Are they like out of a particular church, or is it just kind of a group of pastors and theologians and that sort of thing? Or yeah, I don't think it's any one church. It's a group of guys. I don't know all of them. I've met some of them uh, recently. I was invited to speak at a panel discussion in Memphis at Mid America Baptist Theological Seminary. Now, Mid America is not uh, a Southern Baptist seminary in the sense that it's not supported by cooperative program dollars. But it is a Southern Baptist seminary in the sense that it uh, has served uh, as a conservative alternative to 
uh, or, or for Southern Baptists that wanted theological training that was uh, rigorously conservative. And it began, it arose during the 70s when mm. we really had some problems with progressivism and liberalism in the convention. So it was an alternative there and it's just stayed around and and it's doing good work from all I can tell. I, I've not been real closely associated with Mid-America, but I can tell you, having met their president and vice president, I was very impressed. I met some of their faculty while I was there speaking at a panel uh, that was uh, hosted by the seminary to just address issues in the Southern Baptist Convention. And so, again, you had people there that were both reformed and not reformed, but all were concerned about things we see going on in the SBC. So I don't know if you could say Mid-America is a uh, kind of a hub for CBN or not. I, I really I don't know enough about all the inner workings to speak to that real accurately. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and that's 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 helpful because honestly, I I didn't know some of that either. So mm. that's good. Thank you. Um, the the big thing a lot of people are saying, especially I'm on YouTube trying to build a channel, trying to use that as a ministry as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll, you know, comment on my own videos or other people's videos and stuff. And, you know, I don't know most of these people and the, you know, from Adam, right. They're just yeah. random people. But a lot of times people will say, especially if they're not in the SBC, I kind of get a feeling and I'm a SBC pastor. So are you, yeah. um, so many people are like ships sinking, we're done, you know, abandon ship, you know, lifeboats, get out, get out, get out. You're yeah. we're out. Anybody who still stays is is uh, compromised and this and that. Any you know they'll have this this yeah. ham-handed sort of lowbrow comment about you know all the conservative pastors have already left. Blah blah blah. And it's like, whoa whoa whoa, you don't even know anything about me. Uh, what are your words to uh, churches and and members in general or pastors, just any Southern Baptist really, to say should we stay? Should we go? Is mm -hmm. there stuff that we should look for to say? yeah, the tide is shifting or no, let's abandon ship. Yeah. Well, those are tough questions. And I always preface my responses with, look, this is a conscience issue. Uh, every man, every church has to decide what they believe before God they ought to do in terms of stewarding their time and energies. I've written on this uh, quite a bit, spoken about it. So there's a couple of articles you can found at founders.org okay. where I've addressed a specific issue about how you can stay in the SBC right now and be faithful while fighting and contending to try to recover uh, the, the convention to a more healthy foundation that we seem to have drifted from over the last, last five to 10 to 15 years or so. And, and most, of the, most of it unwittingly, I believe. Yeah. So here's the, I just had this conversation 30 minutes before getting on with you uh, with a <laughs> pastor friend, you know, and he said, I just got to ask you again, man, why in the world would you uh, uh, stay in the SBC? He's not SBC. He said, do you really think it can be changed? I said, well, yeah, because I believe in God, you know, yeah. and uh, God raises people from the dead. So yeah. uh, he had a good re rejoinder to that. He said, well, yeah, he said, I guess the, the Democratic National Party could be uh, changed, too, then couldn't. I said, well, sure, it could, you know, but I mean, there are there are times when you look at something, you say, OK, I can no longer be associated with that. And that could be true of the SBC. It has been true for the SBC with many, many churches. More churches have left the SBC in the last two years in my lifetime than, than at any other time that I'm aware of. And I, I mean, I've had, it's, it's weekly, it's weekly. I'm hearing from guys saying, we just can't take it anymore. Um, they feel detached. Leadership is unresponsive or, or sometimes leadership is very condescending toward those that raise legitimate questions, but I'm staying in our churches. Our elders have talked about it. And we, we believe we ought to stay in for the time being. And we think we'll know over the next two or three years, kind of, you know, which, if we uh, have reasons to, to remain hopeful, I, I hope that we will, um, because the reality is this. If, if all the good churches leave the SBC tomorrow, the SBC is not going to die. It's mm -hmm. going to continue on. It's just it's going to be it could become like the PC USA, you know, which has continued on for a decade and really bad or not a decade, a, a, a century in really bad hands. Yeah. And so it's become a force for really a, a lot of bad stuff. And I don't want to see the SBC become a force for bad stuff. It's got so much inertia that it's not going to go away instantly. Mm -hmm. And that inertia uh, has bound up in it a lot of institutional value and things that have been used for great good in the kingdom. And I would like to see them continue to be used for great good in the kingdom and those that have drifted to be recovered. So it's worth the battle 
And, you know, nobody likes to fight. I certainly don't. I don't like looking at people that I know and some of them, my friends I love and say, you know what, you're dead wrong. And uh, this has happened on your watch and you shouldn't have let it happen. And you probably need to step down from your position of leadership if you're not going to repent of your dereliction of duty. And yet the convention is made up of churches and the churches own all of the institutions and entities. And if those institutions and entities are not going to be responsive to the concerns of the churches, then the churches have the obligation to hold the leadership of those institutions and agencies accountable. Mm -hmm. We do that through our trustee system. We all, we have trustees. The problem is our trustee system is broken and many trustees feel like they're just there to be cheerleaders for the institution rather than recognize, no, you hold the institution in trust for the churches, right. You're accountable to the churches. So we've, uh, we've just lost our way and we need to recover that. And, I believe we can. I, I think it's happening. I know it's happening with more and more churches. Is there enough? Uh, or will there be enough churches? I, I don't know. But uh, God knows. But I think that we do have an obligation to try to sound the alarm, to, to call churches, to wake up and look at what's going on. And if you're dissatisfied with it, well, well then you need to make that known. If, if you're happy with it, make that known, too. But yeah. when people become educated on the issues, I'm finding that most of the churches that I'm in touch with are very dissatisfied. Some to the point that they say, we're not going to put up with this. We're gone. And yeah. I understand it. Yeah. Wow. Uh, you mentioned just for a moment, the trustees, you said the system's broken. Can you flesh yeah. that out a little bit more? Sure. I think most people don't really know kind of the whole system. Yeah. Well, the, the Southern Baptist convention has a very specific polity. It's, it's cumbersome. Uh, you know, it's messy and it's designed to be s slow. So you can't you can't make ma massive changes in SBC life immediately. And that's a good thing. You know, that's that's good. You wouldn't want something that could change one way to the other every year. You know, 180 degrees. That'd be that'd be impossible to uh, sustain and live with. Right. But the way it works is this. Uh, you elect a president and the president of that convention. He appoints a committee on nominations. So that's all his people. That committee in turn appoints a committee on nominations. And then that committee on nominations make nomination. They make nominations to the convention that meets annually. And those nominations are comprised of trustees of our institutions and agencies. Those trustee boards are designed to turn over, I think it's about every, so maybe between four and eight years or 10 years or so. It's a rotating system. You know, you have a, a maybe a third will go off every yeah. two years or something like that. And so while the president doesn't appoint the trustees, the president has tremendous opportunity to be influential through his appointment on the committee on committees who will appoint the committee on boards, who will then recommend trustees to be elected by the convention to see those trustees hold the entities in trust. Well, what has happened is that these trustees very often, whenever they're appointed or, or elected and become new trustees, the institutions over which they're supposed to be exercising trust, the executives of those institutions will bring the new trustees in and wine and dine them and, you know, just fill them up with good gifts and all the uh, glad handing and almost make them like PR people yeah. for the institutions. And the trustees then, and I, I mean, I'm talking about personal experience I have with trustees when I've called them and talked to them or stopped them and talked to them. And uh, you get the impression you're talking to a staff member of the institution <laughs> rather yeah. than a trustee. Wow. It's, it's nuts. And so that's what I mean. The, poly, the, the process is broken. We need a process in place where our trustees are trained with what it means to hold the institutions that they serve as trustees for in trust for the churches. They're accountable to the churches. Okay. No, that's good. That's super helpful. Thank you. Um, all right. So moving on, just, you mentioned the president, obviously the elephant in the room, he's not in this room, uh, but uh, is the serial plagiarism of Ed Litton, right? Yeah. And I know some people have tried to soften that. Some people have been very super critical. Some people have been, oh, you know, Mark and you know, Luke, the Gospels, they they plagiarize divine, you know, <laughs> just silliness. Um, how since <laughs> since he hasn't stepped down and there isn't a way to remove a president. Right. Um, and he hasn't stepped down from his church or anything like that. What 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 can 
the average Southern Baptist do besides just say, yeah, forget it. We're leaving because you guys are a bunch of hypocrites. Yeah. What, what can the average Southern Baptist do, average pastor do, and so on? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on that. Uh, one thing you do is make your voice known. You know, we say that we think this is not right. We think that you ought to step down. There's actually a church in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, where Denny Burke and Jim Hamilton serve as elders. I don't know who else is there. They passed a resolution calling for Ed Litton oh, to step good. down. Yeah. And so associations of churches can do that. Local churches can do that. State conventions can do that. Uh, it's not going to be popular. And, you know, people will accuse you of being mean. Uh, yes. doing that, but you can do that. You can write Ed Litton yourself. I've done that. You know, I, when I, yeah. first heard I, about, I emailed him to his, uh, I think it was his church directly, but yeah. I mean, I just said, look, brother, get some people you trust and, and have an honest conversation. Let them speak honestly to you. Cause this, this looks really bad. You know, I don't know. This was the first, when the first one came out Yeah. and, uh, since then I've called for his, uh, uh, his removal or his, he needs to resign from being president. I, I wish his trust. I wish his elders at his own church loved him enough to help him. But evidently, you know, they've figured out that, that they've worked out a way that, you know, it's fine for him to stay as pastor, fine for him to stay as president of the convention. So yeah. in that regard, you know, we ought to make our voice known without being vitriolic or mean spirited about it. Again, I don't wish ill will on him. I'm really, you know, I'm concerned about him. I don't think it's healthy for him to mm -hmm. be this, no matter who he is, put a bag over his face. I think it's just <laughs> a very unhealthy situation. But beyond that, Every year, the convention elects a president. Now, typically, if you get elected once, then you're kind of almost automatically given a second year, but it's not automatic. The convention mm -hmm. has to vote. Sometimes they, they will vote with, you know, uh, by common consent, and that's okay. This year, in, in 2022, it's not going to be common consent. There will be a contested uh, presidential election, and I hope that whoever runs against Ed Litton will win. And mm. that Litton will not okay. be reelected. And again, I don't mean any ill will for him. I think it'd be healthy for him. I, I know it'd be healthy for the convention. And uh, I just hope that happens. And so, but it's not going to happen if churches don't send messengers out mm -hmm. there who are upset and dis, who do not appreciate the direction of the convention, what Ed Litton has done in his uh, dishonesty in preaching, and then with the ways that he seems to want to take the convention. Yeah. Is there anyone nominated, do you know of, or how does that actually work? No, I don't know of anybody. I mean, anyone can nominate any Southern Baptist to be president. So, you know, you could show up and say, hey, Joe, you want to be president? I'm going to nominate you. And you, you could do that. <laughs> and uh, I mean, that's just part of our kind of messy polity. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it doesn't typically work practically that way. And usually there are conversations and I've heard conversations. I've heard of conversations. I've not been a part of them, but I've heard of conversations where uh, people are being discussed as candidates. I've not heard any specific name if, or if I have, I don't remember it, but I don't think I've heard any specific name mentioned as, oh yeah, this is going to be the guy that ought to run. Uh, but you know, there are qualified men around what we just need an honest, man, I would prefer to see a pastor because I think a, a pastor has to look people in the eye every week and uh, you, you have to deal with souls every week and care for a flock. And I want a man who knows what it is to care for a flock mm -hmm. and who's got some backbone, who's courageous, who's not going to, to kowtow to the SBC elitists whenever they come around and, and either try to glad hand him or intimidate him. Uh, we just need a man who's, you know, who fears God, doesn't fear people, not trying to please people, but is going to try to do the very best that he can to lead this convention of churches in a, a more God honoring way than the path we're on right now. Yeah, no, that's that's good. Has anyone asked you? Do you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get asked. Uh, I get asked periodically. Uh, and my my common response is I'd rather be <laughs> by a bag of pennies than to uh, <laughs> I say to some of my friends, I thought you liked me, you know I mean? I you, uh, so, Gotta take one for the team. Yeah. You know, I just, that's, it's not, <laughs> not anything I want on my resume, not anything I've ever aspired to. Um, so it's, you know, I just think they're a lot better guys than me that could do the job really well. Fair enough. Um, you Is the extent, and we'll just dwell on this and we'll move on to the next question. Uh, you said the president admit or assigns, you know, the committee that they, mm. then that committee, Appoints right. trustees. What else does the president do? Because again, I mean, I know we're not Roman Catholic, right? And mm -hmm. some people aren't, you know, if they're cross-denominational, you know, we can be pastors as long as 
you know, the Lord leads. We're not going to be moved around. We're not, right. you know, the churches vote for the pastors and so on. The president doesn't have a ton of power, really, uh, over the local church anyway. Is there anything else that he has generally that can that can be exercised and changed and whatnot? Yeah, well, every every Southern Baptist church is an independent church. And so that's important for people to know that, you know, I'm, our Grace Baptist Church is as independent as any independent church of any stripe. Yeah. And nobody tells us what to do. Uh, we we cooperate uh, voluntarily where we can, as we can and where we can't, we want. And, you know, there's there's parameters to that, obviously. But the parameters are pretty loose for mm -hmm. identifying with the SBC. The president doesn't have a lot of official power. Um, he appoints the Committee on Resolutions, which is a new committee every year. And so we've seen the importance of resolutions over the last few years with some of the boondoggles that the recent committees have uh, foisted upon the convention. And then he is, I think, an ex officio member, maybe of all the trustees. I can't remember, but at least many of the boards of trustees, he's an ex officio member. But then he appoints, or, yeah, he appoints that Committee on Committee committees that mm -hmm. then appoints a committee on chairman or committee on uh, uh, nominations that then they make nominations to the convention. The convention does have to elect their nominees. So it's not, you know, any, there's no one person or group of people that make those appointments. However, having said that, so that's, that's it officially, that's all yeah. his official duties. But as we saw with Ed Litton, you know, the next day after the convention, he is on CNN uh, and talking about critical race theory and how, uh, you know, the convention, I don't know if you saw the interview, it was hilarious. Uh, the, I, think, I think I did. You know, the interviewer said, well, so it was, you know, so the Southern Baptist Convention affirms critical race. Theory. Oh, no, no, we don't affirm it. Oh, so, so you deny it. No, 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 we don't deny it. You know, and the woman <laughs> was, going, uh, okay, well, I don't understand. You know, it was, just, it was really funny. So you, you have a bully pulpit, you know, yeah. you can speak. And certainly we've seen it with JD Greer, uh, in one of the, sermons that he gave a couple of years ago about uh, when he was president that God whispers about sexual sin. And uh, just so happened to be, that's one of the sermons that Ed Litton plagiarized. And so yeah. Ed Litton says, you know, God whispers about sexual sin. And so that stuff goes out. People hear it. Well, I mean, if you're president of the Southern Baptist convention, JD Greer got invited to the white house mm. as president of the Southern Baptist convention, the, the, the Southern Baptist convention I like to put it like this. It's not that important, but it matters. It's mm -hmm. not that important that it doesn't, it doesn't dictate how Grace Baptist Church or any of the churches in the convention operate. We're independent churches, but it matters because it is the largest player in the Protestant world, in the evangelical world in the United States and in the West. Yeah. So what, what we do matters. Our resolutions get printed in the New York Times. Stories get written about positions that we take. And the president becomes the face and in many respects, the uh, the mouthpiece for the convention for good or ill. And it's been for ill many times over the last yeah. three years. So um, it matters. I, I, you know, I, I, that's why I want a good man. I would love to see, again, a God-fearing man who's a pastor who is not going to be intimidated that will not say stupid things and will speak for God, honestly, to a culture that is in desperate need mm. of prophetic voice. Yeah. Amen. Um, I kind of touched on that. Um, I know you just mentioned the critical theory stuff, woke, right? That's obviously kind of the lingo that a lot of people will use mm -hmm. uh, as well. The, again, the average Southern the Baptist, right? But even seminary students or, or college students looking to go into ministry, what can they do to, again, kind of combat stuff? I mean, there are, you know, there's multiple books out, right? We've got Jarvis Williams, we've got Curtis Woods, we've got Eric Mason. Of course, there's the kind of more leftward, Ibram X. Kendi's and others. Um, what can they do to either prepare uh, or once they're there, I mean, you mentioned Mid America, but you know, Southern, uh, Southeastern, Southeastern. Um, what can they do to, in the meantime to really kind of shore up and say, "Look, have your convictions. Go from here. This is what you need to do." 
Yeah, well, um, take advantage of learning opportunities. Like Bodhi Balkum is, te- I, I, I'm the president of the Institute of Public Theology that founders started this last year. And Bodhi Balkum is teaching, he's one of our founding faculty members. He's teaching a course on cultural apologetics okay. here in Cape Coral in January, 2022. I would encourage everybody to come take that course. Uh, it's it's dynamite. I mean, he and I've talked about it. I'm looking at his uh the perspectives on the course, the textbooks, and Vody is so clear minded on this. So we, we founders has produced tons of material over the last three years on these issues. If you just go to founders.org, get on our website and just Google uh, for, or do the search engine on our website for uh, woke or critical theory or social justice, you, you'll find enough material there to spend hours, hours and hours and hours educating yourself. So that's, that's one thing. And then when you hear this stuff come up, ask questions, ask questions. Now that's one of the uh, signs of, according to Robin DiAngelo of white fragility you know, is whenever you question things, because what we're told is if you don't just show obeisance and roll over and say, Oh yes, of course, what you said is right. I'm guilty. Then, you know, you, there's something wrong with you. That's proof of your <laughs> racism. That's proof of proof of your misogyny or of your homophobia or whatever, but you got to be clear minded enough to understand what the Bible teaches and what it doesn't teach. And don't let people twist the scriptures on you and just keep asking the question, where do you get that? You know, I mean, who says that? Uh, What make, why do you call me a racist simply because of my background? Why do you think that I'm a misogynist and hate women because I believe in male headship in the home? You know, why, why do you think I hate, homosexuals because I believe that sodomy is a sin. And I mean, just, but have your Bible open. Don't be intimidated to ask the questions. Don't, don't let them, the fact that they're going to call you names, ridicule you, make fun of you. I mean, if you, if you get scared when people say boo, you probably need to get out of that arena until you can figure out how to avoid being scared when people say boo. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. You guys have a lot of stuff on founders for sure. Um, do you do your show by the way, like the, is it every day or like five days a week or. Yeah, we do the show, the sword and the trial podcast once a week, once oh, okay. a week. So okay. yeah, it drops on Tuesday afternoons okay. and, uh, we're going to be announcing, I guess this is the first time I'm talking about it publicly as I hear it come out of my mouth. We'll be announcing <laughs> a, an addition, an additional podcast. that will be coming out at least once, maybe twice weekly beginning uh, early in January. So oh, cool you know, your listeners can be the first ones to uh, know about that. And uh, we'll, we'll, again, we'll be announcing that over the next few weeks. So yeah, we're hoping to continue to build it up, but you know, when we're uh, I'm, I'm a full-time pastor and so I got plenty to do. And uh, this is something that I want to do and try to do to, in order to help other pastors, other churches. And you know, as God enables us, we'll continue to produce that kind of material. Good, good, good. Um, I guess just overall, I kind of just, any last thoughts you might have as far as, you know, the current climate? I know we kind of touched on leave a church, don't have the church leave or not leave. Mm-hmm. Uh, what should, can someone do, college student, seminary student, and just the average Southern Baptist? Do you have any other words or thoughts? Um, yeah. <clears throat> well, I do. I, I think for every Christian, I, I say this a lot. I've been saying it for years, but especially the last couple of years, is find a healthy church and build your life around it. One of the most heartbreaking things that I've had to endure the last couple of years is stories, story after story after story. Again, this morning, another one of Mm -hmm. people having to leave churches because their churches or their leadership has gone woke or has refused to take a stand. I mean, our church here in Cape Coral, Florida, we've got, I don't know, five, six, seven refugee families from Canada that these are faithful church members, pastors, you know, at at least a couple of them have been elders or one pastor who have moved out of Canada because of the repressive uh, uh, situation there and uh, the difficulties and their churches being shut down and churches divided and all. Um, It's heartbreaking. So find a healthy church, do whatever you've got to do to get to a healthy church and build your life around the church. Don't Mm -hmm. think that you're going to do well uh, living out there in the hinterlands by yourself. And I, I church, churches have gone bad. I hate it, but it's, it's happening. And if that's your church, try to talk to your leadership, see if you can't help them to 
think about things, to get materials that might uh, provide a perspective different that's different than the current narrative that is so popular. And yet, if your church is not going to stand on the authority, inerrancy, and sufficiency of Scripture, then you need to find one that will and build your life around it. And then as a church, be willing to take a stand and be willing to be hated for the glory of God, mm. because that's what some people will do. Uh, you know, I, I quit caring a long time ago what people think about me and say about me. And, it, you know, if you read your Bible with both eyes open, we shouldn't be surprised whenever people will uh, revile you and persecute yeah. you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake, Jesus said. In fact, he said, when that happens, you should rejoice and be glad for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Yeah. So, you know, this is an opportunity when you take a stand for Christ's sake and then for his sake, you are ridiculed to rejoice that you've been counted worthy to be ridiculed for the sake of the gospel. So just don't be afraid of that. And, and then remember uh, man, our Lord reigns. He rules. None of this catches him off guard. We're yeah. faithful. We, we are called to be faithful stewards of all that he's entrusted to us. So we can't sit this out. We've got to engage. It's not going to be easy, but we don't engage with fretfulness. We don't think, oh, no, what's going to happen? Uh, no, the threat's real. The danger's real. But Christ is king and he's ruling. And so let's be enthusiastic. Let's be joyful hopeful and determined to not budge one inch in declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ and his lordship over every dimension of this world. That's such a positive. I don't know, Tom, that's so positive. I mean, <laughs> where's your despair? You got to be despairing. That's what sells. I know. Uh, I read the book, you know, <laughs> so. that's right. Yeah. I know how it ends. Right. Uh, no, that's good. I appreciate the time. Is there any, any last thoughts? I know you just gave us a bunch of wisdom. Any other no, I mean, you want to talk about? you know, if we can help you in any way at Founders, we want to. Um, so just founders.org can go there. Yeah. The Institute of Public Theology, I'm really excited about that. Um, so you can go to Institute of Public Theology.org. I think it's founders.org too. Yeah, that's right. Both of those are .org. And, um, you know, learn that we got tons and tons and tons of resources we make available to people. We got books we're publishing, podcasts, uh, sermons, and um, articles that we're writing always trying to address the issues to the best of our ability in the light of what the scripture says. So just let us know if we can help you in any way, we will do it. Um, thank you for having me on. I'm, I'm delighted yeah. to be a part of your show today. Yeah, no, thanks again, Tom. And the Institute for Public Theology, that is, is that only in person or is that online or a little bit of both? It's hybrid. Yeah. So all the classes will be taught in person, but we're recording them. And uh, so Bodie's is the third course. I taught an introductory course on pastoral theology. Uh, Jim Mort taught a course on great books and theology. Tom Nettles okay. was supposed to have taught a course on the first part of church history, but due to illness in his family, he had to uh, reschedule. So he'll be on next year. Uh, we got Mark Coppinger, who's your old professor, yeah. who will yeah. be teaching a course <laughs> on uh, philosophy in February of this year of 2022. And then Conrad M. Bayway, who oh, okay. is the Spurgeon of Africa, is, is be teaching a course on preaching. We've got Carl Truman lined up to teach on ethics and James Dolezal and the doctrine of God. We, we've got a great, great faculty. Wonderful. And so you can take all the courses here in Cape Coral, but. Uh, we will record them and make them available. So you can audit these courses. You can do a three-year program through the Institute of Public Theology and come out on the other side, we believe, uh, with an opportunity to be fairly well-equipped to engage in pastoral ministry in a local church. All of this has to be done under the auspices of a local church. So if you're not a faithful member of a local church and not commended by a local church and, you know, what you do with us wouldn't be helpful. So we're not going to let you be a student at IOPT. But if the church really invests in you seriously enough to send you, then uh, we'll be glad to try to serve you to our best ability too, in, in providing some materials for training. Excellent. Excellent. Well, again, thanks so much, Tom. And yeah, check out founders.org. Uh, it's definitely a huge, huge uh, resource and Institute for public theology as well. Yeah. So, yeah. all right, well, take care. And, all right. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.